nailed it. How do you do? Thank you. You know, I always learn so much listening to you that it's very hard to follow um, with my own talk here. So what I wanted to do is actually take a lot of the themes that actually Alistair has been talking about and talk about in the context of these other sort of mega trends that we're seeing today around cloud computing, SDN, Internet of Everything, and try and do that all in about 15 minutes. So we all know we live in the Internet. We experience this every day. But some of these numbers are just astounding. Uh, more data was created in 2012 than in the last 5,000 years. We probably all recognize that. You know, yesterday, I was just bringing home from Best Buy two, two terabyte drives just you know, to back things up that I have in my house. And I feel like, honey, with that milk, go get me another petabyte of data, please. Uh, we need it for the kids. You know, and also, we're seeing now that transitions already happened between physical machines and virtual machines. There are more VMs now being spun up than we have physical hardware for. So when we have that kind of a transition, and here we're saying like by 2016, now 71% of the apps are actually going to be running on those virtual machines. So what, what's different about that? Well, a virtual machine you know, is just, just a bunch of bits. You, know, you can stop that. You can write it out to a file. You can put it on a, uh, on a drive and give it to somebody else, things you could never do. So we, we really are beginning to move up. Uh, the abstraction chain here is where we're beginning to have digital representations of things that we use, including the servers themselves that do the computation. Um, a lot of the data now shows that by 2017, you know, two-thirds of the mobile traffic will be video. Uh, that's phenomenal, particularly since I have a, a daughter who refuses to FaceTime with me because she's a teenager and still is in text. I'm going, oh, it's so old school. It's all got to be video. But I think that we're really going to see that transition happen now and that most of the internet traffic we already see is now video, surpassing everything that we've done in the past in peer-to-peer -peer music sharing and everything else. Moving forward, then, by 2020, we're going to have over 50 billion. That's 50 billion connected devices. They obviously all want, they're not going to be desktops. They're not going to even be our laptops. This is much, much larger. Many, many more things are, are becoming connected to the internet. And all of that, then, we're being express, expressing that in terms of these different kinds of things in mobility, in cloud computing, changing the application landscape. I don't think we're going to see these big suites of, of office app productivity apps anymore. We're all becoming very narrow cast in the applications designed just for that one purpose. Even that's entered our vocabulary, there must be an app for that. And so this leads to the real need for these kind of scalable open cloud platforms. A lot of what Alistair is talking about, moving from these kind of organizations to an organism, because we're really having to be connected to many, many more things and many, many more people. And so in terms of networking, we have to start thinking about it now. The network then has to respond, and we want it to be much more sort of application-centric. The purpose of the network, in essence, is to respond to the needs of the application to provide the kind of quality of service, the user experience we all have come to expect. So IT is seeing these changes come in real time. You talk to any of the CIOs of companies, these are a lot of the things they're, they're having to think about uh, in a time of reduced budgets. And so they're seeing internet, um, internet of Things or Internet of Everything when you count people in that mix and bring your own device. They're seeing more and more devices coming into the enterprise, connecting into the networks, more and more applications that are being used aside from the, the systems of record applications that used to be in the past, and a really shift to this mobile access. So we need to be able to respond to that kind of change to accommodate that. In many ways, we're also seeing those devices and the number of interactions people have online with your customers, the consumers, and everything else. You have an enormous amount of data, enormous amount of information on your customer base, how your manufacturing processes are working, how your supply chain might be working. And that promotes an idea of using a big data and the analytics that goes along with that. This allows us with customer behavior, but also optimizing your systems. And you have to now be able to deal with a really diversity of different kinds of data and, and sources of data. To do that most effectively, we now are finding the need to have the cloud platforms. So I've been a big user, for example, Amazon's cloud, AWS, which is just a real breakthrough technology in showing how easily it is. And I always want to say to somebody, if you really want to know cloud computing, use your Amazon account or whatever, just spin up your own server. You can you know, just you know, play with it. I don't know what. You have your own computer, and you can turn it off, and it costs you 25 cents. 
And that's a big, big change because it, it means people can start to experiment a lot more. And we can move much more into this kind of agile environment because the, the risk now is so low, you can do it at such a low cost, you can begin to experiment. Also, when we're facing this big data on slot, we have to have scalable services. So we have to be able to flex these services that around Christmas time or in the, in the, in the, in the morning rush hour, you have a lot more data than you have at any other time. And cloud computing platform software is a way to do that. Of course, and that impacts the, the infrastructure itself. So just as virtualization has affected how we're designing servers and applications that sit on top of that, the network itself now is becoming much more programmable, having programmable interfaces, which we call software-defined networking. This allows things so software can now dynamically interact with the network itself, changing configurations, routing traffic differently during those hours of peak load and everything else. And we start thinking now about virtualizing a lot of the network functions themselves. Why, isn't, why don't you have firewall as a service? load balancing as a service. Instead of these things being these individual kinds of, of appliances, you want something that can scale over time. Yes. Pointing at it doesn't seem to work, right? So one way to express this in, in a big project that I've been working on at Cisco has been also understanding now how is this software going to be built? And one of the things we've been contributing to very heavily has been OpenStack. It's an open source project where a large number of not only customers but IT vendors are getting together to collaborate to build this kind of new platform service. And one of the things we wanted to pay particular attention to, and in fact, it's really the, the, the main open source cloud project that is addressing networking head on. In addition to having a compute service, similar to Amazon's EC2, or a storage service, such as S3, there's something we call quantum, which is a network as a service. This allows a conversation to actually happen between two very interesting layers. One is the application layer, and the other is everything that's changing now in the networking. Everything that we're calling software-defined networking now has APIs that allow us to do the changes I had talked about, and we want to be able to have the application have a say in that. So the application, instead of just immediately like blasting out you know, 10 gigabytes streaming data or whatever, and the network going, my god, what's going on? How do I accommodate this? In fact, the application could say, by the way, create a network that is optimized for streaming media. And now the, the infrastructure underneath can be reconfigured to accommodate that. So it's really creating this conversation between these what were two separate layers through something uh, such as OpenStack. That moves us into this world, I think, of this application-centric networking. It's actually an old term. Uh, we talked about it for many years. We talked about, for example, WAN acceleration, where you might be caching locally, a lot of the documents that are used in a branch office or whatever. But it goes much, much deeper than that. We're now approaching it with this new way, picking up this kind of agile, dynamic changing, being able to apply consistent policy, policy-based routing and things like that become very important because, in fact, that's what you have to be able to control. If you're having all of these devices, all of these people coming now, being a part of your network, you need to be able to have policy around that. So one, you don't get overwhelmed, you don't get broken into, and a lot of these other things. So that brings up to the Internet of everything. And this is really, really increasingly going to be touching our lives. I think we're, we're just beginning to see this happen around us, even though less than 1% of the things that sort of could be connected are today. So we're going to go from 1% to 30% to 50% over time. And what this is really about, if you think about it, is, is using connecting sensors and measurements and controls and people in real time so that you can improve the kind of reliability cost. And this funny thing around like alignment of supply and demand. Instead of over-provisioning all the time for you know, what you might see as a surge in interest or demand or whatever, you can dynamically adapt to this. And you can actually control this. So we're seeing this coming out. People usually use examples of smart grid, of smart buildings, where we can control the thermostats and most more efficiently utilizing the heating systems, smart factories, and is extending smart factories also out into the supply chain. It's really scheduling of the loading docks that becomes very important, so you can have just-in-time manufacturing that, that goes very deep into your supply chain. Uh, being a resident of San Francisco, one of the apps I like in use of this is this thing where now in San Francisco, the city's decided to actually instrument the parking spaces. 
So not only now will it take a credit card and things like that, but now I can actually use an app on my iPhone and it will tell me where the open parking spots are. And that creates a wonderful kind of feedback loop because now I can avoid driving around for hours trying to find the parking spot. That reduces the overall carbon emissions and wasted time and everything else like that. The city knows how the city is being used because it can really see what is the occupancy at different parts. So in fact, it's responded by having dynamic pricing of parking now, depending upon hour of day and other kinds of things like that. One of the more interesting parts of that also is that there's been an effort now made to open source the data itself. Because they recognize they can't be the center of innovation. They're, they're a city government. Instead, what they're doing is they're open sourcing the data so that anybody, you in the audience, can now have access to that data and build your own applications, use it in your own businesses in different ways. So we're seeing not just open sourcing the software, but open sourcing data as being an important part of this whole mix. So the role of IT in business is really going to change because of this. It's no longer just delivering these, these kinds of systems uh, for your financial services and ERP, but you're really going to have to start thinking about how do you use sensors, how do you use devices, BYOD, all of these things, and what do you do about identity and location? Networks and protocols are now changing a lot because where the networks are becoming much more adaptable. You're having to look at and hire data scientists as a part of your organization to optimize your business. They're going to be gathering an enormous amount of data and being able to make intelligent choices based upon that data. And then there's control systems. So control systems, if you think of factories, but if you think of actually your supply network as being a control system. All of these things. So those of you who are engineers in the audience may remember control theory and dust off those books, because I'm telling you, it's going to come back on real force. And then statistics with, with the analytics and data scientists. So all of these things are, are being revisited and having a big impact not only on the infrastructure itself, but how IT, in fact, is itself organized. So how much is at stake? Well, Cisco did a study and estimates this could have as much as a $14.4 trillion value over a couple of years here. And about $9.5 trillion of that is in these kind of direct uh, advantages in terms of the, the application of smart grid and things like that. And there's another $5 trillion affecting the rest of the industry. This is like you know, reducing you know, through telecommuting, those kinds of things that allow, when you apply technology to, to how you actually organize your, your workforce and everything else, you can have tremendous savings there. Meaning that we can overall grow corporate profits by about 21% in 2022. This certainly would help with, with our budget issues. So another sort of lens, those of you who are fans of Jeffrey Moore, make sure to, to, to see one of his latest talks on uh, moving from systems of record to systems of engagement. Uh, it's very thought-provoking. He says, you know, with the, with the you know, Y2K bug and everything else, we basically have finished with IT. Sort of, you know, it's an echo of Nicholas Carr's, you know, IT doesn't matter uh, rant from a couple of years ago. And really talking about systems of record are the things we all know, the financial systems, ERP systems, HR systems, uh, CRM systems. And what's becoming important, we're basically done with that. We know how to do that. You actually, the number of employees in your company is not growing that fast. They actually are in place, they're doing well. You can get increased efficiency out of that through virtualization and everything else, but those systems are basically done. The new systems that are gonna be developed will help you in terms of systems of engagement. That so much of the business now is we have core and context. Well, context is everything that is required in the rest of the ecosystem for your business to survive your supply chain, your customers, the retail stores you deal with, the, the agencies you do used as a part of your business. All of those systems of engagement now are going to become the new IT. That's where if you can start to manage that, you can have tremendous value creation because you're now applying technology to a broader part of your organization and not having it be the guys in the back room who are running the books. So all of this together, when you start thinking about it, I've uh, talked, unfortunately, before as this kind of, you know, a perfect storm, these things interacting. The other way to think about it is kind of virtuous cycle of innovation. 
That is, Internet of Things, bring your own device, increasingly connecting things into your, your infrastructure drives the need for big data because you want to be able to analyze that, you want to be able to respond to it and organize that information. That drives the need for cloud computing because you have to have now a flexible, agile infrastructure that allows your, the application of computing resources to flex and change over time as these, as these things come along. And then that drives in the change in the SDN, in, in the networking infrastructure as you go forward. This thing keeps a cycle going. They feed each other, they drive each other, and they cause each one of these things to become more and more important. So volume increases, the velocity increases, and the variety of information and data that you have to manage increases. So of course, this is very disruptive. You know, the old ways don't always apply to the new. This is creating all sorts of now new opportunities for new startups, for people who are starting to think about this differently thinking about this much more as an organism instead of just that organization, thinking about the connections between all of these things. And of course, that's where I think the real drivers of future economic growth is going to come. So if we have, I'm out of time, but if you have one question, I might be able to uh, accommodate. Yes. <laughs> I just gave that talk. <laughs> yeah. the, you want, the connection between an application-centric world, SDN, SDN and the virtuous cycle. Yeah. So, so I'm really talking about what really matters at the end are the apps. That's what we consume. That's what we use every day. That's what drives the whole rest of the business. And or, because now apps are changing because of the way the world is being connected, they drive a change in what we need in our infrastructure. The infrastructure in terms of a cloud platform computing surface that we want our applications to run on, which is by and far the fastest way to develop and deploy applications. And it changes things such as networking infrastructure. Because how data flows now change very dramatically as we have all of these apps, all of these sensors. And so that's creating this kind of a virtuous cycle that now feeds back on, upon, on itself. When you do that better, what do you do? You create more apps. And you keep creating this cycle that goes around and around as we're moving forward and essentially digitizing our world and our lives. Okay, well, thank you very much. Hope you've enjoyed it.